Buenas tardes. Yo soy José Alamillo, profesor de estudios chicanos y chicanas aquí en la Universidad de Channel Islands en Camarillo. Um, bienvenidos a todos a nuestro seminario. El seminario de esta noche se trata de la aplicación de la ley de inmigración, confianza a la policía y violencia doméstica. Y vamos a hablar sobre los resultados de investigaciones y los impactos en la comunidad. Um, welcome. My name is Jose Alamillo, professor of Chicana and Chicano Studies at Cal State Chano Islands here in Camarillo. And I want to welcome everybody for tonight's um, webinar titled Immigration Enforcement, Police Trust, and Domestic Violence. So we'll be presenting research findings and community impacts. So before we begin, I wanna introduce Naira and Mariela who are gonna talk about the interpretation that we have tonight. So I'm gonna pass it on to Naira and Mariela. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Naira Pacheco y estoy aquí acompañada con mis colegas eh, Mariela, Benito y Alexia. Y este mensaje se dará en español, inglés y en mixteco. Eh, Do, los organizadores de este evento mantienen un compromiso fuerte a la creación de espacios multilingües para que más de nuestra comunidad pueda participar. Por este motivo, esta reunión será interpretada simultáneamente en inglés, mixteco y español. Así que a favor de escuchar y hablar en el idioma que se sienta más cómodo. La interpretación ya está activada. Si usted está en su computadora, verá aparecer un globo en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Y si está en su teléfono, va a haber tres puntos en la parte de abajo al lado derecho de su pantalla. Si es que está conectado por la aplicación de Zoom. Haga clic ahí y haga clic en interpretación de idiomas y seleccione el idioma que habla. Creamos estos espacios con el apoyo de todos. Favor de comunicar cualquier problema en el chat. Oh, y gracias. Y ahora vamos a escuchar el mensaje en mixteco. Aba yu ganane María Lara yo yu vichinchina compañero y andas con indito. Ya si Benito si Neira si Alexia. Na shakinya evento yora kunina nya na kuniso yo takundi no to nya ka takundi ayo nya kwenta nunde yo ra nya ka ke bichira kuniso ndo ndashkoni ndi tu kwenta nya inglés tu sa shinya tu ndavi tu sabi ra tu kuvira kuniso ndo na tu kundo nya nya ke bi kunda nindo ra nya ka kuniso ndo ya David con Vanaña no andas con ni nada un vestido la tundica con su computadora la chiti su pantalla con el fondo ni globo la tu su teléfono dica ahora no pantalla chiña parte ni aplicación sombra con ni junia o ni punto de ni menos la tendira chinta ni da aku anya pantalla hora kwashifu no kanya interpretación de idioma de sara kwashifu no kanya ya tu kuni na kuni de ya ta kundi dora tu ya yo ne kuchon don da ni do shinta kara ka do shinti shin kwanda ya cha de sha win dora ku win da viskondeña kwanda no da shkoni na tu wichi Gracias, Mariela. Gracias, Naira. Okay. 
Uh, vamos a empezar este seminario. So now we are going to start the uh, webinar. The uh, title is Immigration Enforcement, Police Trust and Domestic Violence. Uh, we are going to learn about the impacts of um, the involvement of a local police at the a federal enforcement of immigration on domestic violence. And uh, we are going to talk about the uh, personal experiences in Ventura County and all the implications on security, public security and safety. And we're going to start with Catalina, who is going to talk about the research findings. Catalina, we are going to start uh, with you. So, hi, thank you for the introduction, Jose. I'm going to see if I can share my screen with you all. Could you see, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Are you able to see one a big presentation or both? Can you full screen it, please? Simplemente por eso lo preguntaba, porque con las dos pantallas se ve. Voy a salirme de aquí un momentito y lo intento otra vez. Ahora, ¿lo veis mejor ahora? Sí, muy bien, perfecto. Empezamos. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, the invitation to speak today and uh, share some of the things that, well, that we have uh, found in uh, the research on this topic of immigration enforcement and domestic violence in police trust. Okay, so to let everybody know uh, what is specifically I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the purpose is really to share uh, some evidence on what has been found empirically in research uh, regarding the relationship between immigration enforcement, sanctuary policies and domestic violence against both immigrants as well as more generally Hispanics in the United States. And before I go any further, I just wanted to remind everybody about some acronyms that you might be seeing in the slides. And in case I don't say it, um, you can remember what they are, but um, you might see sometimes IE is for immigration enforcement. Uh, sometimes I will have SP for sanctuary policies, DV domestic violence. And later on, I will also talk about VAWA, uh, which refers to the Violence Against Women Act. All right, okay, so before uh, going deep into this topic of the relationship between enforcement and sanctuary policies and domestic violence, it's important to provide a little bit of a context. And the context for this discussion really stems from the rapid growth of immigration enforcement. Um, just to give an idea, just right after since 9-11, the United States has really witnessed an unprecedented increase in immigration enforcement. Uh, really, uh, from uh, part of it stems from the growth in immigration, in, in federal spending on immigration enforcement. So I just wanted to share with you, some of you, uh, this graph, because I think it illustrates it very well. You can see here what have been the annual budgets. Uh, for really two agencies that are in charge of immigration enforcement in the United States. One of them is Customs Border Patrol, CBP, and basically they are in charge of enforcement along the border. And then ICE, which is Immigration Customs Enforcement, which has been traditionally in charge of immigration enforcement in the interior of the United States. And basically what this graph displays is that the spending um, of, by these agencies has rapidly risen over time. So uh, if we go back to when DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security, 
in charge of all these agencies was created. It was right after 9-11. The budget for these agencies has doubled or tripled. And it's by far larger than the federal budget, for example, for other enforcement agencies, such as the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the Drug Enforcement Administration. So uh, this gives you a sense of the growth of federal spending on immigration enforcement. And at the same time, a lot of localities and states across the United States have been basically taking immigration matters into their own hands. And really, uh, this has occurred through a number of policies. Some of them were in place uh, in California. Some of them have not been in place of this list. But really, I just wanted to list them just to give you a sense of the different types of measures um, that really um, led to this tenfold increase in immigration enforcement just between 2005 and 2010, for example. Um, so I put here uh, a table that displays what these measures were. I kind of um, classified them into police-based measures and employment-based, police-based refer to measures that really involve the local and the state law enforcement. And these are measures that have been by far the biggest contributors to deportations in the United States. Okay, um, so- Alina, uh, yes. perdón, ¿puedes aprender el video para ver, podemos verte? Uh, Could sí. you turn your video on so we can see you please? Thank you. Can you see me now? I think it was on, but I cannot see it. I don't understand. I don't know why it's not coming up. One second. Yes, it was actually on. I am not sure why. You can't see it. Okay, let's see video settings. Can you turn my camera? Yes, I can't. No bien porque siento mucho, pero no me sale. Y, y me salía antes. Sí, and uh, it was working before. I don't know why. Okay, let's see if it works uh, later on. Okay. So what I wanted to share is that uh, all of uh, these lesson part of why we're talking about this topic and why is related to domestic violence. I guess uh, I switch actually to, to Spanish without realizing. But the reason why we're talking about uh, this, this in, in, in enforcement. Okay, there's somebody in the room, I think. Um, Liza, can you please mute your microphone? I think we can hear you over the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So the reason I was bringing up this issue of immigration enforcement is because it has contributed to a lot of deportations and many of them occurred uh, dramatically during uh, 2008 through 2014. This is a period when secure communities uh, was basically just expanding throughout the United States, but they have continued to today. So um, I inserted this figure just to give you a sense of the extent of deportations from the United States by these two agencies that I was referring to before. And even as 2019, they exceeded by uh, uh, they exceeded 250,000 per year. So this is an amazing number. Um, and many of these deportations, I also wanted to note that they are for non-criminal offenses. Uh, and this is important because even within the classification of criminal, um, right now, uh, after the criminalization of illegal entry and reentry to the United States. A lot of them are criminal, but really it's because these are illegal by the far, by far, most of them are illegal entry or re-entry, which in many countries, and in fact, in the United States prior to the 90s, they were civil offenses, not criminal. So, um, but even so, you would see here in this graph that the non-criminal have been rising over time. Um, so why do we care about enforcement and domestic violence? Why? 
Well, there are several reasons I wanted to point out. And one of them is the prevalence of domestic violence. Um, in the United States, one in four women are victims of domestic violence. And if we look among Hispanic women, this rate is one in three. Not only that, but also 63% of these victims usually endure multiple episodes of domestic violence. So it's just not a one-time event. In addition to the prevalence, um, this is uh, uh, one, um, it's characterized by very low rates of reporting, uh, particularly among Hispanics. And one of the main reasons for the low reporting refers to the fact that really a lot of them fear police uh, and deportation, uh, especially amid increased immigration enforcement. This has been actually shown by a number of studies but I wanted to show you also in this next slide um, that basically uh, just reports uh, the results from a survey that was conducted in 2017 among victims of domestic violence. And they were being asked why they did not call the police. And you can see that by far the largest share of them basically indicate fear of deportation. And even if they indicate other reasons, they are mostly related to fear of enforcement one way or another. Okay, immigration enforcement. So uh, whether it is immigration enforcement or immigration enforcement showing up near the courts or immigration enforcement showing uh, police uh, good turn the victim to immigration enforcement, et cetera. So it's really all about enforcement. So this tells you that indeed, not only the prevalence, but the low reporting is associated to enforcement. This is not actually something that you can see in just research and surveys, but in fact, even police departments across the country have noticed this. I put in the title of this slide, uh, one of these statements from the LAPD, so Los Angeles Police Department from 2019, recognizing that this was a problem. I in, posted here also one of the New York Times uh, articles. You can find very similar ones in the LA Times, in the Washington Post, and other major circulation journals. Okay, so in fact, here I put one in which uh, you have the report and the quote from a woman called Domenica that she was saying, he told me nobody could help me because I don't have papers. So very clearly, it indicates how fear of lack of support from sponsoring partners and deportation in general is one of the main reasons why immigrants are not reporting, in addition to many times low socioeconomic status and dependence on partners. Wow. So these are very important issues. Yeah, Catalina, can I see the slide with, where you indicate the, the, the New York Times out of Los Angeles Times? Yeah. So it's, it's basically here. I don't know how, you, are you seeing it or no? Uh, I don't think so. If it's if it's not if it's it's I'm only seeing slide number eight. Why is it paused? Um, okay, let me see maybe, if I can. Yeah, sometimes maybe just try it again and then. Yeah. How about now? There we go. Now we see it. Yes, oh, thank perfect. you. Thank you. All right. So basically, this is what I was uh, discussing that you guys were not seeing before, but this is basically. Uh, is what just one of the new articles. Actually, there are many other ones. If you guys want to see them, I'll be happy to share them. But there's basically, they are in LA Times, in the Washington Post, and many other journals, they also have similar ones. So this is not a one-time thing. Um, so uh, so I, I wanted to share this because in addition to the prevalence and the low reporting rates, another reason why we should care about immigration enforcement and domestic violence it's really because it affects a very large share of the population. So even if we just focus on migrant women, migrant women account for about 13% of the nation's female population. That's a big number. And even if you focus on immigrants, uh, women that live in uh, mixed status household or in couples that are like um, uh, couples with one non-citizen and a non-citizen, I put data here. This is actually a graph from the American Community Survey in the United States covering 2001 through 2016. It covers the entire country. And you can see that the share of those couples have been rising over time. So this is not something that is going to stop. The prevalence would actually rise. And finally, another reason why we should care about this topic and why immigration enforcement affects domestic violence is because the cost of domestic violence, both economically and socially, is very high. 
Um, just to give you an idea, in 1995, uh, the CDC, uh, reported that for the United States only and for adult women only, the cost of domestic violence exceeded six billion US dollars. So these are costs not only in medical and mental health care costs, but really also cost in productivity losses many times. So for all these reasons, we really should care about this topic. And so what have been some of the remedies uh, to address this issue of domestic violence and the close relationship of enforcement with domestic violence. So a couple of things. One is that back in 1994, Congress passed what is called the Violence Against Women Act. And the VAWA Act, basically what it did is that it allowed legal and undocumented migrant women who are dependent on their spouses for sponsorship, either because they are legal permanent residents or US citizens. Um, to petition for their immigration status adjustment if they were victims of domestic violence. So this is one of the measures and it was really meant to address domestic violence against immigrant women. And the other one has been really sanctuary policies, which in a way by uh, really uh, diminishing the cooperation between local law enforcement with immigration customs enforcement we really intended to increase community trust and cooperation with the police. So increasing the ability for people to come forward to the police and report when they are victims of a crime, such as domestic violence. And so today I wanted to talk about three different studies, the, the findings from three different studies, and I'm just gonna summarize the main findings. So the first one really um, is just alluding to the link between enforcement, sanctuary policies, and domestic violence among immigrant women or against immigrant women. And the way that we look at this in this study is by looking at the self-petitions under VAWA. So uh, basically uh, the reason why we focus in these VAWA self-petitions is because this remaining married in the United States is essential for foreign spouses of US citizens or legal permanent residents to adjust their temporary status to a permanent status under the family-based category. So for that reason, they are more likely to stay together, even if there is an abusive partner. And in fact, there is research that has shown that the odds of domestic violence are actually way higher for immigrant women who had a spousal dependent visas and for those with partners that either refuse to petition for their status adjustment, or many times threaten to report them to immigration authorities. So because this was a problem, actually Congress back in 1994 passed this act. And the act, it was intended to allow non-citizen spouses to petition for their own status adjustment, as well as for their children's status adjustment without fearing deportation. But the problem is that even though the intention was good, one of the main problems is that to request that status adjustment, they needed to provide supporting evidence to basically uh, the US citizenship and immigration services is one of the arms of the Department of Homeland Security. And in fact, this is a, it's, it's a slide that basically shows you the detail on the VAWA self-petition process. And all I wanted you guys to see here is these documents and I bold, put in bold and underscore here, evidence of the abuse, such as reports and affidavits from police, judges, court officials. So you can imagine why this supposes, this basically, it's a huge burden for immigrant women, especially if they fear that they are not gonna be, if they have undocumented status, or they fear they will not be supported even if they are legal under a temporary status, by their spouses for sponsorship to a permanent status. So there are different things that, there are different ways in which immigration enforcement and sanctuary policies might affect this, this willingness to report domestic violence and come forward and petition for this status adjustment. And so one possibility, which is what we end up finding is that maybe immigration enforcement actually results in a drop in these self-status adjustment petitions among immigrant women, meaning that there are 
um, just because there is decreased reporting by migrant victims. So maybe when you have more immigration enforcement, migrant victims fear uh, facing greater scrutiny and compromise their ability to stay in the United States by coming forward. So basically you see a drop in these petitions. By the same token, you could see an increase in these petitions if uh, really sanctuary policies are enacted. And by having these sanctuary policies, migrant victims feel more comfortable coming forward to the police and reporting any domestic violence. And so because of this higher reporting, you see an increase. Dale. Entonces, uh, so basically, I switched to Spanish when you. <laughs> so basically, um, so we could expect this relationship if indeed uh, a lot of the what is happening is fear to report. OK, and in fact, this is what we end up finding. However, um, you could also see that maybe you could argue that maybe this is not the case. And what is going on is that there are changes in the incidence of violence. So for example, another possibility could be that maybe we see VAWA self petitions, so fewer women trying to request this status adjustment when, in, I'm sorry, an increase in these petitions when there is more enforcement because of increased violence. And this could occur, for example, if offenders feel emboldened and uh, um, just because they know that immigrant victims are less likely to report when there is more enforcement. So if that is the case, then we should be able to see more VAWA self petitions. And if there is, for example, the case that with sanctuary policies, um, the offenders are more afraid that they are gonna be reported by their victims, maybe we should see a basically decreased violence and a drop in VAWA self petitions. But basically we don't see those. You can see, I wanted to show in here both because you can see in the press sometimes arguments made one way or another. And I wanted you to, to basically, I wanted to tell you that what we find is A, is this first a scenario. So what we find actually is that uh, when we look at these VAWA self petitions by immigrant women in the entire United States from 2000, to, from 2000 through 2016, okay, what we find is that these petitions, this reporting of domestic violence fall when you have tougher immigration enforcement, suggesting that basically it is decreased deporting and reporting and they actually rise when you adopt sanctuary policies, a signaling that women are more likely to come forward and report to the police. So basically, yes, the direction of these impacts, along with the fact that we actually find that the incidence of other crimes related to domestic violence that are not likely to be affected by reporting, like homicides, uh, do not change. Those do not change. So. This suggests that it's not incidents, it's really about reporting. And it really goes along with this story of fear to come forward to the police. So, so not only this is true among immigrant women, I wanted to tell you in this presentation that this is true even among, if you look at Hispanic or Latino communities. So here I wanted to talk about this study also because it's very close to us. It's in LA, it's focusing in Los Angeles. It's looking at call for domestic violence to the LAPD and how they are affected also by this immigration enforcement. And it gets also to the bottom line of this reporting to the police. And in this case, basically we, we're actually looking at Los Angeles. So this map that you see here in blue with different blue colors, this is Los Angeles. And these are different census tracts in Los Angeles. So it's like districts in LA. And basically the different colors indicate different concentrations of Latino non-citizens. So the darker ones indicate that there is a higher concentration of Latino non-citizens, the lighter ones less. Basically, what we did here is that we uh, gathered data from uh, calls for service that are dispatched to the LAPD, to Los Angeles Police Department. 
all the way from 2014 through 2017. And basically, we also gather information on what was the level of awareness about immigration enforcement um, of individuals living in those districts. So we gather this by gathering data on Google searches about immigration enforcement. And in these graphs that you have here on your, on your right, in the upper one, you can see that this awareness is indeed directly related to the number of deportations by ICE from Los Angeles. So it is a good measure of enforcement. And it's also related to the number of detainers sent by ICE to the LAPD, another measure of enforcement. Okay, so basically this, this is just telling us that these are, this is a good measure of immigration enforcement or the extent of immigration enforcement in Los Angeles. And basically what we did with this study is to show, or we basically what we wanted to see is if heightened awareness about enforcement was actually linked to fewer calls to the police to report domestic violence, especially in Latino neighborhoods that have, or, la, or neighborhoods in LA that have a higher concentration of Latino non-citizens. And so what we find, I just put these graphs, I mean, actually these graphs were not controlling for other things. If, if I were doing that, you would see this line even more emphasized. But basically what I wanted to show you here is that what we found is that domestic violence calls per capita dropped in the LAPD reporting districts with a higher concentration of Latino non-citizens as immigration enforcement rose. So when people are more aware about the extent of enforcement, so if you move in this graph in, to the right from minus 0.5 to zero to 0.5 to one, this is awareness. So as awareness about enforcement increases, the numbers of per capita domestic violence calls to the police drops. So they are inversely related. So basically what this is, is just confirming what we saw in the prior study. So really that there is some empirical evidence of a chilling effect of immigration enforcement on this Latino immigrant engagement with the police and the willingness to call and report domestic violence. So this is a serious issue. And this again was using data from Los Angeles Police Department uh, during an extended period of time. And then finally, I also wanted to comment in case people say, well, it's because it's LA. It's really not about LA, it's really the entire United States. So in this other study, in this last one that I wanted to tell you about, we look at the same issue Actually, we focus more on sanctuary policy, but really for the entire United States. And so what we try to look at is at the impact that these sanctuary policies, how they can help in preventing domestic violence. And so what we did, um, well here before I just wanted to show you how these sanctuary policies have been expanding over time. So this graph is just showing how the number of counties in the United States with a sanctuary policy has been rising over time. So it was very much flat during a large period of time from 2000 through almost 2013. And then they increased significantly. The, much of the increase came out along with the adoption of the statewide trust tax, but there have been, they have been rising over time. And these sanctuary policies, this increase is what we use in order to examine how this increase in sanctuary policies might be impacting domestic violence. And so, as I was telling earlier, sanctuary policies can be really helpful in curtailing domestic violence through different channels. So an important one we have already discussed is by really increasing trust in the police. And this trust in the police is critical because of course, it can lead to earlier reporting of events and save lives. So if you go, if people feel more comfortable reporting to the police, chances are that you might reduce the escalation of any violent attack to the level of a homicide. And there might be also be fewer offenses 
if offenders fear that victims are more likely to report when there is a sanctuary policy. So trust in the police is critical, it's a channel. The other one is also that when you have sanctuary policies, you empower women to basically be more willing to work, maybe become more financially independent, more likely to break free from abusive relationships. So this is a very important channel as well. So sanctuary policies are really critical for that matter. And basically what we find in this study that looks at all Hispanic women, it's no longer immigrant women necessarily, and it's not only women or Hispanic women in Los Angeles, it's the entire United States. So when we look at the entire community of Hispanic women in the United States, many of them US born, but in mixed status households, okay? Um, from 2003, through 2017, and for this we use data from the Unified Crime Reports. This is basically the Federal Bureau of Investigation database. And what we do with this data is that we look at the impact that sanctuary policies might have had on domestic homicide rates of Hispanic women. We look at domestic homicide rates, okay, for one reason is because homicides are very unlikely to go unreported, unlike other domestic violence. And the other reason is that they provide what we call a lower bound, is the minimum effect or a lower bound of domestic violence. Okay, we know that domestic violence is gonna be way higher than the level of domestic homicide. So if we find an impact of sanctuary policies on domestic homicide, chances are that impact is gonna be even much larger overall with domestic violence. Okay. Um, so, again, we gather data from all law enforcement agencies across the United States. So this is not just focusing LA. Okay? And what we find is that sanctuary policies lower domestic homicides of Hispanic women by an amazing 50%. Okay? It's huge. The impact is huge. And this impact really did not precede the policy adoption did not precede sanctuary policies. It's not something that was there prior to the adoption of the policies. And it's not explained by changes in policing or in population composition in those areas that adopt the policies. Okay? So it's really due by, to the policy. And there are two channels that we find that are critical. So one is this increased trust in the police. And in fact, we know is that for several reasons. One is because the effects of sanctuary policies in reducing domestic homicides among Hispanic women are, if anything, greater in areas with more immigration enforcement. They are also greater when you have more female police officers signaling that women might feel more comfortable coming forward. And they are also greater when there are no mandated arrest laws. Maybe because a lot of households fear that once they report an event, they cannot back up in those cases when there are mandated arrest laws. And the other thing is that we find that it's also related, let me just move my, it's also related to increased financial independence. So what we find Bien, is that Hispanic women have lower, basically in areas with sanctuary policies, there are lower unemployment rates for Hispanic women. And this actually helps women also break free from abusive relationships. So again, sanctuary policies appear to have a very important effect, not only in increasing trust in the police, but also in sponsoring this environment of increased financial independence. So just to conclude, um, I just wanted to summarize saying that overall the evidence, the empirical evidence, suggests that immigration enforcement curtails the reporting of domestic violence. This not only we find it for immigrants, but we also find it for Hispanics at large. And the other thing is that we find that sanctuary policies help to do exactly the opposite. So they counteract that negative impact of immigration enforcement and this hints on the very important role of the policies in promoting both trust, in promoting the trust of this community in the police and overall cooperation with law enforcement, which are critical to resolve and address these crimes. 
So I will stop it there. And uh, I'll be happy to address gracias. questions. Muchísimas gracias. Se me olvidó presentar a doctora Catalina Muento Dorantes. Gracias, doctora de profesora de economía de la Universidad de California. Uh, thank you. Uh, a law professor from uh, UC Merced, uh, Sir Wright, yeah, thank you so much. So we are going to and uh, now uh, go ahead and so if you have any questions, you can just add them in the Q&A function. So uh, we are going to start three people and then Isela, and then Maria, and then Julissa, and they're going to talk about uh, what is the impact in our community here in Ventura County? Elisela, go ahead. And if you can, just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. So I am very happy to be here today uh, sharing this space with all of you. My name is uh, Elisela Contreras. I uh, work with uh, uh, MyCop. And well, This is a nonprofit, and we have been working with the community for over 20 years supporting immigrant, indigenous immigrant communities in the central coast of California. Uh, so our services are uh, mainly, uh, primarily focused in six different areas, specifically in the uh, area of healthcare, uh, advocacy, education, family strengthening, uh, labor, uh, justice, among other uh, programs. So we have over 20 programs working towards, uh, you know, servicing the community. And I have been very fortunate to be part of the organization for the last five years, coordinating uh, the evaluation process of one of our programs that it is focused on the early intervention and prevention of domestic violence and uh, mental health. This is called Vivienda Con Amor, Living With Love. And um, currently this program is uh, functioning under a statewide initiative with other 35 uh, projects that are mainly focused on reducing the mental health disparities in other areas and communities that have been traditionally historically marginalized. So uh, this is just a little bit of what we do within and in uh, the organization. I'm very happy to be here with you all. Thank you, Risela. And if you can please slow down because we do have live interpreters, simultaneous interpretation right now. Uh, we are going to go ahead and pass it to Maria. Maria, if you can uh, introduce or present your organization. Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is Maria Jimenez. And I am a resident and I am part of Poder Popular, a popular uh, power here in Santa Paula, but we uh, work in Ventura County. We also have several programs. So we have six different programs and we have also, uh, you know, we help the community in terms of, of food and we distribute uh, clothing and uh, diapers. And also we have this a workshop that's called Imagine that's uh, designed for uh, domestic violence survivors and women. And we uh, teach them to attribute uh, value to themselves as human beings. And we also teach them on how to uh, support themselves so they are able to support their families. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Julissa, can you uh, introduce yourself? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julissa Peña. I'm the executive director of the Immigrant Legal Defense Center, also known as the ILDC. Our mission is to provide equal access to justice and due process to indigent immigrants residing in the Tri-County area. And we strive to do this by, first of all, providing pro bono legal representation to immigrants in deportation proceedings. And secondly, providing community education to help immigrants understand and pursue their basic civil rights. Our main goal is really to fill the significant gap in legal representation resulting from the US immigration system's failure to provide court appointed counsel 
to immigrants facing deportation who are unable to afford an attorney. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, si tienen una respuesta sobre los... los... Uh, do you have uh, any replies to all the uh, research findings of uh, the Dr. Dorantes to all the panelists, if you just have something to say, a comment or another question. So let's go ahead and look at the questions. So we can see them here, the Q&A. So this question's in English. So this is for the doctor between uh, SP and increased reporting. Uh, I wonder if perhaps SP often arise in areas where non-citizens have organized to enact SP and thus are more vocal already. So this question is to um, Dr. Catalina Amuelto Dorantes. Uh, gracias. Um, Lo contesto en español o en Should I answer this in English or Spanish? It's up to you. All right. Okay, so I think that, so you were ask, asking about causation of uh, sanctuary policies. What is it that they emerge? Mm -hmm. All right, okay, so, um, you know, yes, one would think that basically in areas that you have more enforcement, it's where you see more sanctuary, um, but that's not necessarily the case. In fact, uh, many of the sanctuaries initially uh, uh, basically originated in the West Coast, which is not necessarily uh, the area with the toughest enforcement. So you see areas of toughest enforce tougher enforcement, for example, in, uh, I don't know, Arizona, like Maricopa County, or uh, you see it also Texas, or you see it in some areas of the United States that do not have sanctuary policies. So it's not really related so much to enforcement. Um, the, what I have learned overall, uh, what I have seen uh, from the data is that for the most part is more closely related to uh, basically the dominance of, it's really related to politics. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, it's more related to politics than really it is to the presence of tougher immigration enforcement as a result of that people react and pass on immigration, a sanctuary policy, it isn't. Uh, again, uh, you see it in fact in areas that tend to be uh, in a way more benevolent uh, towards migrants. Um, so yeah, that has been my, my findings initially. Okay. Um, I have a question for the panelists, um, um, and I'm going to read this in, in, in español. La investigación sobre la doctora Samuelto Dorantes muestra que muchas personas... So que... this research shows that a lot of people who have experienced uh, a, a domestic violence who are undocumented or have undocumented family members are less... Uh, willing to denounce or to report abuse. So when the cops are actually working um, in cooperation with immigration organizations and uh, agencies, so have we seen that in Ventura? I can start. Yes, well, hi. So first of all, thank you so much for your question. And before I answer, I would like to let people know that the information that I'm going to be sharing today, it is only based on our experiences working with our indigenous immigrant communities and the community in general at a local level. So it is not necessarily reflecting uh, the experience of uh, everyone or, or everybody. So to uh, respond to this, even though if we don't have like very uh, a, a specific data, we have had the experience in yes, it, it, the fear of a deportation, it is one of the barriers of how our communities have the tendency to, you know, be uh, scared of reporting domestic violence or other matters where uh, the police are involved. And I would also like to expand 
On this question, remembering that there are a lot of factors behind why our communities do not report abuse. First of all, is a uh, fear, like we said, fear of also what are people going to say, also being scared of uh, ending up as, you know, single mothers, also being scared of what the family is going to say, either against them or their families, and that comes from their countries of origin. And these threats, the a victim uh, internalizes all of those things very deeply, and uh, women live with this fear, and they're also a vulnerable to uh, a sexual uh, abuse if they do stick with their uh, partner. Also, a lot of uh, instances like the doctor was uh, mentioning, the victim does not have a, a job. They are also facing a lot of uh, financial barriers. A lot of the victims are housewives. They depend financially their partner and if the victim has a job the reality is that we do live in very tough times economically speaking where it is incredibly difficult to be able to support a family by ourselves so and on top of this we are adding the responsibility of having children school child care so these are all just economic factors that are very strong and that could potentially place the victim in a situation where uh, they just do not feel comfortable reporting abuse uh, on the other hand it is also important to highlight uh, beliefs about traditional marriage culture uh shock and religion and normalizing and accepting violence as uh, many other barriers that contribute to not reporting abuse. Also language. Language is a very big barrier, especially for our communities who are uh, indigenous and immigrant because uh, most of our communities speak uh, their mother tongues like Mixteco, Zapoteco, Purepecha, among others. And uh, a lot of victims stop before being able to report an abuse because they're scared of not being able to express themselves and unfortunately this happens more often than not we have had other um situations and you know we have lack of uh, language access and victims of domestic violence do not call the cops and we have also observed that while they do call the cops sometimes because they're scared of these institutions or general trauma that the victim has at the moment of uh, when the cops show up home the victim is not able to express themselves right and unfortunately the version of the abuser is the one on record which they manipulated to their own benefit so in these situations what we have seen is that the victim loses trust in the uh, cops the police and they uh, and never go back to reporting abuse again so from that we can also um, I think about, you know, uh, this being scared of uh, the system and uh, scared of a deportation. Like we said, there's a lot of lack of trust exactly towards the legal system and judicial system because of the trauma of immigration status. There is always that being scared of not uh, reporting uh, the, the violence because you always have this underlying fear of if you get involved in a legal uh, problem, you are risking that that information is going to be willingly shared with immigration forces. So those people use that fear to manipulate or to threat other people, the victims. In this case, we could say that the victims of domestic violence. Also, the victim is usually they're intimidated by their partner letting them know that if they do report to the cops they will be deported or she's going to end up a single mother with the children or they're going to take the children away and that they can also be deported or also threats as we were mentioning all the threats of hurting the family members of their own family family members and communities if they are actually deported so these these are very big threats and it is a fear that the victim internalizes very, very profoundly. And it is a very big barrier uh, to uh, towards reporting what abuse is. And I think that I can share a situation. We had a very specific case not too long ago where the victim 
had been living as a domestic uh, violence victim for years and during one of the incidents she decided to defend herself from her abuser and in that moment the victim was detained and then she was deported she um, afterwards managed to clear up her situation and came back to the country but this reflects the fear that a lot of victims have and the reason why they are not willing to report their abuse uh, another point that I would also like to highlight is the emotional and psychological impact that a deportation entails both for the person, for the victim, and also for their children. If there are uh, children and also deportation, we do know that it is a forced uh, separation of families. On one side, uh, do, we know that because of uh, domestic violence, there is a separation in this relationship as a couple, but the relationship with the children is very important for uh, the parents to maintain. Although there has been situations of domestic violence, and I think it's also important for the child development because uh, the deportation of one of the parents is permanent damage to the family. And I think that it is also very important to recognize that each case is unique and different, but committing a crime such as domestic violence does not mean that the person is bad or that they do no longer have a responsibility to care for their children. So we do think that it is important to uh, have uh, programs of uh, restorative justice intervention and prevention where our families are able to seek support and they are not scared to report abuse and they uh, maybe feel insecure if they're going to receive support or not. So in summary, I'd like to highlight that as an organization, we firmly believe that in order to change our community's perspective, it is necessary to establish laws that offer protection to our communities so that they can exercise their rights. We also emphasize the importance of access to information and education in indigenous languages, especially here in Ventura County, we know we have a large presence of indigenous migrants such as a mixtex, Zapotec, and Purepecha communities. So that's that's my response to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Irisela. I have another question for Maria. Maria, do you want to talk a little bit, uh, give an example of someone you helped, you know, without sharing, disclosing any specific inform information? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit... Mm, this is a topic that that brings a lot of memories, frankly. Personally, I'm a domestic violence survivor. I also have a sister who endured domestic violence and unfortunately her husband killed her. And as my colleagues mentioned, sometimes the victim doesn't want to report uh, the incident, right? Sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's language, and sometimes we are dependent on our um, abuser. And so when one endures this type of violence, however it may be, when this happens to you, you go into shock. And you don't know how to respond. So here in, in our organization, we've had a lot of people who have, uh, who we've helped, right? And it's very hard to take that, that next step. You know, I've been called early in the morning and people with people saying, I need to leave now. Some folks call and say, you know, I had to jump out of a window and, and we have to find resources from them. And so that's another thing is like, sometimes we can't find uh, immediate resources. And recently, domestic violence has increased due to different factors of things happening around us. 
So it's important to be more effective uh, in collaborating with the respective authorities. So for example, we had a case in which there was someone who was um, accusing someone of abusing them, but due to the fact that there weren't any weapons or any other proofs, um, you know, she, she couldn't file a, a claim, but eventually the husband killed her. And yeah, there wasn't any any refuge for, for her. And I remember that this was in Santa Maria and in her process of her moving here to Santa Maria, that, that's where um, she was murdered by her husband. And so for us as an organization, it may be that, well, it weighs heavily on us and myself because we think like, what can, what more can we do to be effective and be a resource to our community? Recently, we had a meeting with the program director of the Family Justice Center, and they invited us to see all the services that they provide. And thank goodness for the center. I am, I marvel at what this offers because they truly help the victim at these centers. You know, there's there's victims who are afraid to denounce their abuser because they fear being deported. But here they are walked through how to file a police report, how to file for a restraining order. There's even lawyers who will orient them uh, uh, to how to process a, a claim with the district attorney and how they can avoid going through this process uh, by having to deal with their aggressor. And I wish there would just be increased efficiency to, to support this, you know? And sometimes uh, people can qualify for a U visa, but, but certain paperwork poses a challenge. Yes, we're gonna share this information and we're, we're gonna share it through the chat. So please hold on for a second. And I have a question. Can you talk about the policies that can make immigrants feel safer coming towards the police um, and how the entire community would benefit from that? Maybe talk a little bit about some of the measures that we can implement um, and how we can advocate for. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for that question, Jose. It's, it's important to highlight, first of all, that the Ventura County Sheriff's Office and the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office um, uh, they do cooperate with ICE, and some of the ways that they uh, that they do this is uh, by facilitating the transfer of inmates to ICE or notifying ICE of inmate release dates. And so, what's unfortunate is that this cooperation is entirely voluntary, and local law enforcement is not required to cooperate with ICE, they choose to do so. And a great example of a local law enforcement agency uh, that recently ended uh, all cooperation with ICE is the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office. Uh, they're one of several uh, local law enforcement agencies that have adopted a departmental policy that would end all transfer requests from ICE without a judicial warrant. And so by ending local law enforcement entanglement with ICE, our counties are prioritizing community trust and ensuring that people released from prisons and jails can return to their homes and communities and fight any deportation case that may be filed against them with the support of their families and out of, deport, out of detention. And so it would also send 
a very loud and clear message to all our community members, including undocumented victims of domestic violence, that it is safe to seek police help. And so some of the ways that community members can advocate for some of these sanctuary policies is to advocate for a bill uh, that's called AB 937, the Voiding Inequality and Seeking Inclusion for Immigrant Neighbors, also known as the Vision Act. And so the Vision Act would close the main pipeline by which California sends immigrants into a dangerous detention system. It would prohibit jails, prisons, and other public agencies from funneling community members who are eligible for release to ICE jails. And so it's important to emphasize that these are community members who have completed their sentences been granted parole, had charges dropped, or have been granted release by a judge, any other person in their custody who is a citizen would be released without the additional punishment of being handed over to ICE. This is a discriminatory practice that only applies to immigrants and it traumatizes and separates immigrant families and children. So the Vision Act will give immigrants the opportunity to assert their due process rights and defend against deportation and family separation. And so many of us can take action to support the disentanglement of local law enforcement and ICE by first of all, calling government Newsom to urge them to stop ICE transfers. Secondly, urging the Ventura County Board of Supervisors to adopt a resolution in support of the Vision Act. And third, urging Sheriff Bill Youth to implement a departmental policy ending all cooperation with federal immigration agencies. And well, there's more information that folks can find in um, the ICE Out of California website that um, we can actually put on the Q&A. And also the ICE Out of Ventura County, uh, which is a sponsor of this webinar. <laughs> so we'll provide that information in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go to the Q&A because we have a lot of questions. So I just wanna um, do that right now. Um, one question from Jackie is, what are the unintended consequences of sanctuary policies? I don't know if anybody wants to address that. Maybe uh, the Dora Abuelo, uh, Dorantes. Is there any unintended consequences? Okay. So, um, you know, actually the, the researchers have been very- See uh, your video now, so nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, I know, I know. I reopened it another, I, I reopened another Zoom and got out of the old one. Thank you, the difficulties. Um, so so uh, to answer that question, a lot of researchers have been looking at that. Uh, of course, you can always hear in the news these reports that focus on one case, okay? And they magnify that case. Uh, so, I mean, we can do that with everything. Um, we can also magnify the case of a citizen and they're, you know, and we just don't do that many times. So we can do that, but statistically, if you're looking at this relationship with, for example, sanctuary policies and increased crime or less public safety or something like that, actually, I'm still to find a study that is published in a reputable Journal. That means that is refereed by other researchers that finds that to be the case. Okay, so um, I would say no. <laughs> uh, actually, what you find, uh, in my opinion, is actually pretty good things. Uh, so the fact that people feel migrants feel more comfortable to participate in the community, to work in the community, to uh, report to the police, and um, Importantly, I think that for the police, whose goal really is to ensure community and public safety, um, having migrants more willing to report and cooperate with them and trust the police is crucial, especially in immigrant communities, um, if you really want to ensure public safety. And so um, I would, quite frankly, uh, I wouldn't be able to find a well-published uh, research uh, that is actually uh, finding the opposite, okay? Um, even though I am aware that, you know, because I've worked on this topic that sometimes you just see some 
uh, whatever, uh, you know, magnification of some event. And yes, there are always uh, like uh, some cases that you can find here and there. But believe me, it, you could do the same thing with citizens. It's not, it doesn't stand up like a statistical meaningful relationship. Right, right. And I think another question that Rosanna is asking, according to your research, you mentioned the relationship between a decrease of domestic violence reporting when there is a presence of ICE in the community. Did you also um, see the same pattern if both partners lack legal status in the US? Also, did you see an increase of domestic violence reporting in a sanctuary city as well? So there's kind of two questions. Okay, so all those questions are really difficult to address in research for the simple reason that the data that, for example, when there is a domestic violence incidence and they report it, and this is recorded in the unified crime report, I mean, it's recorded by the law enforcement agencies, and this data is later on transferred to the Federal Bureau of Investigation into this data set that uh, is called the unified crime reports. We don't have information actually in those ones or if the partner is citizen or non-citizen or, or the composition of the household. We simply know, for example, if they are Hispanics. Okay, so they could be US born Hispanics, they could be, we don't have that information on what is the legal status of the migrants. The only way that you have to get at this is really either through something like looking at VAWA cell petitions, that those are going to be from migrants, okay, mm -hmm. and those migrants are have spouses that are either legal permanent residents or US citizens. So we know they are the composition of the couple, okay? Uh, and that's why I showed you that, that study. Right, right, thank you, yes. Um, we have a question from one person that works in a public defender's office in, I believe, South Carolina. Um, does your data show patterns of LE overcharging immigrants? For example, uh, a case of assault and battery is cleared as domestic violence triggering an ice hold? I don't know if you understood that question. LE overcharging, I don't know what that means. Let me see if I can read it. Um, yeah. It um, so basically uh, the classification of domestic violence is made by the law enforcement agency. So this is not something that I make or that we make. So this is already recorded as such. And you can have also different other crimes, uh, of course. And we looked actually at other crimes, but the interesting thing is that the impact really is, was clear in domestic homicides, for example. Um, so you see, and you don't see necessarily uh, that other crimes like property crimes or burglary or you don't see those necessarily reacting to immigration enforcement or to sanctuary policies, signaling that it's not something else. It's not something else that is going on. And that's why you see the relationship. Well, if that were the case, you could see it also with other crimes, but you don't. You only see it with those related to domestic violence. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So here's a question for the panelists. Um, and maybe you all have a different respond to this, and I think this is a, so uh, if Ventura County Sheriff's Office is now held accountable to the Ventura County Board of Supervisors, what, how would the adoption of the Vision Act really do, right, to get ICE out of Ventura County? So it's a good question. I mean, I think it puts pressure, right, on the Sheriff's Office, and it sends a loud and clear message that the County Board of Supervisors is siding with the immigrant community, right? And it's and it's um, acknowledging publicly uh, to protect and these families from deportation. And so I don't think that, yeah, it's gonna make them, <laughs> but uh, pressure starts there, right? Do uh, the other panelists have a, I mean, and I mean, it happens like, for instance, we have this problem almost every year when we have the Truth Act Forum, which is a forum um, hosted by the County Board of Supervisors, 
where they, it's a measure to hold the county sheriff's uh, department accountable for any ICE transfers that they did during that year. And so they're supposed to explain what types of crimes, how many, how many ICE, tran ICE transfers they facilitated. And um, it's an opportunity for the community uh, to ask for more in information. Um, again, advocate for um, no ICE transfers. And so, yeah, the County Board of Supervisors really can't do anything because the existing um, sanctuary policies that we still have, um, I wouldn't say, I, I think I would go back to the question that um, Catalina got. I don't, yes. I think the problem is that not that there is unintended consequences um, to this, uh, of the sanctuary policies. I think that the, the problem is, is that the sanctuary policies in place are not enough to uh, limit uh, the entanglement that exists uh, between local law enforcement agencies and ICE. And so that's why we're here uh, now pushing for the Vision Act to further limit uh, ICE transfers to ICE and that cooperation between local law enforcement and ICE that of course also jeopardizes as a whole the community trust that the com immigrant community has with local law enforcement. Right, right. It's that chilling effect that Catalina was speaking about that, that really goes beyond, right, uh, multiple communities. So this question is really more for like Isela and Maria. Um, Domestic violence usually results in families being separated, but when there are victims that need to leave their home, what programs are in place to support our undocumented families when this is the situation they're facing? Yes, if I can start with uh, one uh, thing is respuesta y tal vez la señora I think, and maybe Maria is able to uh, share something else, or maybe it's, she wants to contribute something else. But like Maria was saying, you know, with the existence of uh, the Centro de Justicia Familiar, the family justice system, I think it's a really good uh, resource for our victims of domestic violence, where they receive support and guidance to uh, a different uh, resources, you know, pointing to shelters, among other basic of resources and support, but also I would like to recognize that unfortunately there is a lack of services in general, uh, services that support victims of domestic violence and uh, occasionally we have uh, a, a notice that um, these centers are uh, f full and you know, let's say in a Friday all of the agencies are uh, closed, services are no longer taking in families, there are certain requirements that shelters ask for the victims so they are able to check in to a shelter so sometimes this takes a uh, one day two days so we hold the victim let's say she left the household she's here with the children she doesn't have anywhere to go so that's where it gets complicated because unfortunately and generally services require an amount of time, you know, to process documents and to uh, fulfill all the requirements that the victim needs to uh, fulfill before they can be potentially offered um, a shelter. And also, let us remember that, yes, if we manage to get these resources, they're just temporary, right? Maybe one month where we can support the victim where, let's say, a house where they can live. But after that, then the victim is, uh, they need to leave and they need to go out and see for other kinds of support. And I think that's the hard, the hardest part for, for our victims that unfortunately they end up um, returning to their abuser because there aren't uh, enough resources that uh, can support for a longer period of time. My Maria, do you have an answer? Do you have anything to add? Yes. You know, when we, when some families get here or when they're saying that they leave the household and we are not able to find the resource, 
we help them while they're in the shelter we help them um some people uh, are volunteers and they volunteer to take them in for that day. And like I said, we also have the workshop where we help them on how to um, secure uh, housing. We also have different uh, programs and trainings. And also, for example, here, the folks whom we've uh, helped in the past, there's a lot of people who now have their own small businesses, there's promotoras, and they also were able to get jobs. We also provide them with food and clothing. And we also try to um, help them. And we also need to have a more immediate response from all the different agencies that are um, helping. Yes, thank you, thank you. So I think that, you know, we want to share all of the information that we can, and we wish that we could continue with this conversation. This is all very important information. Thank you so much to Dr. Catalina, Dr. Dorantes for sharing all the findings of your research that's very important and we also wanted to know where is that uh, is there a place where we can uh, check these uh, articles or if you're able to share some links with us yes 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 of course and also we wanted to thank Irisela and uh, thank you to Julisa I think that is for the Legal Defense Center, Julissa, and also Maria Jimenez. We also want to, how do you say this? So we said that we wanted to share that information on the chat. I also wanted to uh, thank all the organizers and it's called La Migra Afuera del Condado de Ventura, uh, La Migra out of Ventura County. Also, thank you so much, Buen Vecino, Willie, who was uh, behind organizing this space, and it wouldn't be possible without Willie's efforts. Thank you so much to uh, everyone who was able to be here with us today. And if you want to share some information, uh, please post it in the chat with Julissa, uh, Irisela, uh, Maria, uh, so they so people can get in touch with you if people are seeking, uh, you know, resources and information about here of uh, Ventura County. Thank you so much and a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. And if people have any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for allowing us to be part of this event. And we are here. We can help uh, people who maybe uh, have any questions or if you need more information about the different services that we have available for our community. We are here for you. Thank you. Uh, yes, it was such a pleasure to be here today with you all. Uh, the information we are not able to post it in the chat because I noticed that the attendees do not have access to the chat, but I think uh, we can include the contact information uh, and then you can just uh, do there. Okay, Maria, would you like to share anything? Yes, so I would also wanted to thank for allowing me to share some of the concerns that our community holds. Thank you so much and everyone have a good evening. Adios.
Tu buen tira, yo te llamo a bailar.